So this evening's topic is one of the questions that um, nobody sent to me, but it's one of the questions that I had growing up. And uh, I asked my, my Bible teacher, um, I think I asked him this question more than once, uh, but he really took time in explaining and, and we thank God for, for good Bible teachers. We thank God for people that spend time in the word and I, you know, um, I've had the privilege to ask a lot of different people this question, but to ask the question, how can God, who is a sovereign God, who is a good God, how can he allow evil and suffering in this world? Now, that is a question that I don't think a half an hour service can answer. Definitely, definitely not. Uh, I don't think a six week uh uh, every day kind of session will will help sort this question out. But we're going to look at it in terms of, you know, because this is one of the questions that, that we as uh, young people get a lot, a lot of the youth, uh, a lot of people in schools and in varsities, we, we face this question a lot. How can, if you say you believe in a God that is good, how can he allow so much suffering and evil and pain in this world? And so let's look at it and let's break it down a little bit from scripture looking at it only from a scriptural point of view in terms of we want the lord to to give us an answer and qualify our thinking in this regard so first of all the lord offered to mankind free will we see in the garden of eden adam and eve were, were in the garden and the lord gave adam an instruction but didn't didn't uh make him do something and this was my question why did the lord give adam the choice to take off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil um surely he didn't have to give him the choice and then you know we wouldn't have been in this fallen state but if god takes away our free will which is basically what makes ryan ryan and Bali and Bali and Melissa Melissa if if God had to take that away from us well then what happens what happens to us as people because without free will let's take one of the most important human concepts without free will how would we know what love is and anyone who starts humming a tune now keep, keep you know keep that under wraps I'm just <laughs> but, but how could how could we know uh, what love actually is if we didn't have free will? Let's look at it in in terms of uh, in terms of a robot, right? Now we're all thinking about it in terms of AI and, and all of these things. I'm sure the thought has crossed everyone's mind at some stage as to what happens when robots take over the world, or if robots could take over the world, uh, right? Would a robot be able to experience love? Because there is a set of rules that is given to this thing. And yes, maybe that rules can be misinterpreted because we give, you know, um, whoever seen the movie I, Robot, it's, uh, you know, you, you, you get that concept, okay? Uh, to those that have not seen it, uh, you know, it's, it's where... The robots were given these set of rules and and these commands and then it starts following it in such a way that it, de it determines that the the best thing for the human race is to be locked up and to be uh, imprisoned because the human race is what's killing the human race right so the only way to protect humanity is to lock everyone up uh, but in that through those sets of rules you cannot you cannot experience love through the set, through a set of rules and a programming you cannot sorry you cannot experience uh, hate you cannot experience joy you cannot experience anything that we hold dear as humanity you would not be able to experience and when we think about things if you are at a point and we know at this time with COVID, and this is one of the reasons this question came to my mind again, because so many people are passing away and so many people are infected and so many people are living in this doubt as to 
you know, if I have the sickness, am I going to die tomorrow? And I've been at a stage in my life where I where I didn't know if I was going to wake up the next day uh, sitting in hospital. And, and at that time, the things that you've accumulated and all of these things in life, they don't matter anymore. What, hap- what matters is the experiences and the people, the love and the joy that you share. And if we were programmed by the Lord, then we would not be able to feel this. And that's why the Lord has given us free will so that he could know who loves him. So that he could show us, first of all, his love. If you show a robot love, that robot can't reciprocate. Maybe it can't even understand that love. But the Lord has given us free will so that, first of all, we could understand how much he loves us. And secondly, so that we can reciprocate or we can reject this love. And for those that reciprocate, he has made a provided way. And for those that reject, he has also made a, a provided way. Those, those ends are very different though, right? So now that we understand that God has given us free will, then we need to consider the, the, the concept of secular morality. And there was an article that was published just this week uh, talking about the the 20 uh, most dangerous cities in the world to live in. And South Africa, out of the top 20, South Africa had five of the, of the most dangerous cities to live in in the world. And would you believe, I didn't believe it, but would you believe that Pretoria is the most deadliest city to live in in South Africa? It is the fourth most dangerous city in the world. I'm sure the Pretorians would argue with me that Joburg is much more unsafe. But yeah, this is what the stats say. Okay. Um, uh, I also thought Joburg was more dangerous. PE was on that list, which for some reason doesn't, you know, the friendly city doesn't seem like uh, people are, are, are as dangerous as Joburg. Anyway, that's what it is. So South Africans should be the last people on earth talking about secular morality. Secular morality means that if there is no overarching law or if there is no religion that is that has provided law, that people would still live in harmony with each other. That's what secular, secular morality means. It means do not govern me, I will govern myself. And if everyone just governs themselves, there won't be crime and there won't be, uh, you know, uh, life will carry on in harmony. But because you give us the rules, that's why we want to break the rules. It's a, it's a stupid argument. I mean, any, anyone with, uh, you know, any, anyone that looks at it from an intellectual standpoint will see the, the problems with saying that there is such a thing as secular morality. But when we come back to scripture, the biggest problem with secular morality is its, most, its one most underlying theme. And the, and the most underlying theme of secular morality is me. I will govern myself. I will do what is right for me and my family. I will pursue my goals and pursue my happiness. This is secular morality. This is what secular morality is born out of. And we have seen in, in Sunday study and in a couple of studies that we have done so far, that the one thing that the Lord has come to save us from is myself. I know Ryan. Right? Ryan on the outset, on, on the outside, and to a lot of people, looks like he's got it together for the most part. Most people that get to know me for more than five days know that I don't have it all together. But I'm trying. But I know Ryan better than most people. And I can tell you one thing. That if the Lord hadn't saved me from myself, and if he doesn't save me from myself on a daily basis, that I would actually be a wretch. Uh, still, still am. But I would actually be the most useless human being known to mankind if the Lord doesn't save me from myself. The laziness, the getting upset, or the whatever it is. All of these things, that's what the Lord comes to save us from. And that's what secular morality is preaching. And this is where scripture defies what people are saying outside in the world. 
And the Bible clearly says, Paul is talking, or Paul is one of those Christians that we all look up to. And Paul says, I die daily. He needs to. He needs to kill off his own me. Not that he mustn't have joy. He must have joy. Not that he mustn't be ambitious. He must be ambitious. The Bible says, do not be slothful in business. The Bible says, the joy of my salvation. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. All of these things. But what he needs to kill off is that wanting more by any means or wanting, pursuing my joy by any means. And the Bible speaks against that by one concept. And the concept that is made possible through free will, which is love one another. In Romans chapter 13 verse 8 says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now he's going to break it down for us. Let's listen carefully. For this thou shalt not commit adultery. Why don't I commit adultery if I love someone else? Well, because if I love my neighbor, I won't steal his wife. Right? We can understand this concept. Thou shalt not kill. If I love someone, even though they did harm to me or even though they they irritated me at some stage or whatever but if I love them I can be annoyed with them I can be angry in that moment but I do not kill this person because I love them you know think of it like brothers and sisters my my brother spent most of his life you know wanting to punch me in the face but I, I don't think he ever wanted to kill me right this is this is the reality, right? If you love someone, as annoying as they are, you, you still want them to be alive. Do, thou shalt not steal, right? We don't take something that doesn't belong to us. And this is something that is rife in South Africa to the point where we think it's normal. It is not normal to, to steal. It's not normal to be stolen from. Thou shalt not bear false witness. This is twofold, right? And it's something that we don't really consider sometimes. Uh, thou shalt not be bear false witness means you're not allowed to lie about someone, right? It also means you are not allowed to gossip about someone. Whether you believe that that gossip is the truth or not, you are telling one side of a story. And that is bearing false witness. Gossiping is of the devil, please. We as young people, let's not let's not carry on that that nonsense right? thou shalt not covet if someone has something we don't we don't want it to the point where we would we would uh, you know uh, lie to the guy and steal it or whatever whatever we do not pursue things with the heart that is uh, you know you know with with with, uh, with an evil heart we do not pursue something with an evil heart if there be, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in the same, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So he's saying, if there be any other commandment, I'm talking about going through every single law that is in the, in the Bible, every single commandment that the Lord has given, it can be comprehended, not that it, it can be done, you still have to keep the law, but it can be understood. Comprehension is to understand something. It is briefly comprehended in the same. I can I can understand the format. I can understand the format of it, or the overarching or underlying uh, concept of this, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If I love my neighbor, I will keep these things. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law in 1 john 4 verses 7 and 8 it says beloved let us love one another for love is of god and everyone that loveth is born of god and knoweth god he that loveth not knoweth not god for god is love right so if we don't love one another don't say that you love god it's that's a fallacy if you don't love one another then you are not born of God. And maybe it's hard to love someone 
And maybe you're not born of God yet. I, I trust that everyone on this call is born of God and, and has love for, for their neighbor. But when you're speaking to someone and someone says, no, but in my heart, I really hate you. Well, then they're just not born of God yet. Bring them in. Pray for them. They can be. All right? Everyone has a time for being born. Um, so this is, this is one thing. And this is where secular morality is combated in one, in one statement. Is that we do not love ourselves more than we love others. We prefer one another over ourselves, as the Bible says. And that there, preferring one another over ourselves, that is how we combat uh, any evil. That is how evil uh, is, is vanquished. Now, I put a, a picture on the first slide, and I didn't talk about it. But the, the one statement that I always got from my Bible teacher, and it was a picture of Henry Ford and his Model T. And uh, I asked the question, how did God allow suffering? And uh, my Bible teacher, uh, Brother Rudy, um, for, for those that know him, he said to me one day, he said, why uh, God uh, or, or Henry, Henry Ford invented a car. And one day he was looking and he went to a scrapyard and he saw a couple of those uh, smashed up cars in there. And someone asked him, why did you make such a, well, why, why did you make such a scrap of metal? Do you think Henry Ford would have taken that question uh, lightly? If someone says, hey, hey, that, uh, why'd you make such a mess? And I often thought about that. He didn't create uh, that wreckage there. He created something that is good. And if we, you know, for anyone that has lived without a car for a little while, you know what, uh, what a necessity it is in this day and age. You can't, do it. you can't do much without a car. You need transport, right? And that's what he built. He built a mode of transportation. He built something that is good. But it is those that have not followed the law using those vehicles that have wrecked the vehicles that has you know uh, to the point where following the law in terms of driving the speed limit in terms of indicating when you're turning in terms of you know uh, keeping a, a fair distance behind someone all of these things it's absolutely necessary and if you don't do that and meet in an accident is that the car manufacturer's fault not at all it's your own fault so when god created the earth he gave man a free will, but it was what man did with the free will that has brought the, uh, the country, our state, our province, and even the entire world into such a state. We have allowed this to happen through our own lust, through our own, uh, through, through our own me, if I can say it that way. The Lord did not create it to be so. And that is an answer that has always stuck with me and has always made sense to me. Yes, the Lord created the world. He gave us rules to, to follow. Those rules weren't given so that he could lord it over us and just, and just watch us fail. No, that's not the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law was for our protection. What was the law? Do not kill. Yes, that is for our protection. Do not steal. Yes, that is for our protection. Uh, do not bear false witness. Right? All of these things. Honor thy father and thy mother. That is for our own protection. Because our parents know better. We don't think so at certain ages, especially 13, between 13 and 25. We think we know a lot more than we do. And that's where the parents' guidance and all of these things come into play. And we see so many times how that has saved us from things. Right? We see, you know, when, when we get a bit of gray hair, we'll see these things. But how wonderful it is to see these things, that the Lord has put that law in place for even our protection. Right, so we must remember that. And let's look at the concept now of suffering. So now we, we went through a bit of why, uh, you know, evil, right? Why does the Lord allow evil? He doesn't want there to be evil, but he has given man a free will. And man has chosen evil and continues to choose evil. And how do we combat that? 
by giving up ourselves. All right. That's in a nutshell, all right. that concept of ego. Now let's look at the suffering. And I want to go through some scriptures now. In 2 Corinthians 12, verses 6 to 10, it says, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that which he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Paul is talking here and he's saying, there's this, you know, people, people sometimes think of me higher than they should think of me. And people exalt me more than they, more than they should. And, and let's, let's speak honestly and bluntly to this point. Yes, there are ministers of God, true ministers of God, that we have respect for and that we love, right? And this is a necessity within scripture. We have to give honor to those that carry the word. But we do not exalt any minister. There is no minister that deserves our praise or our glory. That belongs to God alone. The Lord says, for I, the Lord, am a jealous God. My glory will I, sh will I not share with another. Right? That is the fact. Right? So Paul is saying now, people here can look at me and they can hear things of me and they can, ex they can exalt it above what is even coming out of my mouth. That's what he's saying. They can take it to mean even more than what I'm actually saying. And they can see me to be even more than what I actually am. And for that sake, imagine that, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. I've been given so much revelation of the word. It says, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations. So the Lord has given me so much of the word and revelation of the word that people have been exalting me now or people can exalt me now. And for this sake, the Lord stuck a thorn in my flesh. And I, uh, uh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. That's how, that's how tough it was, right? And it says, for this thing I prayed three times to the Lord. And the Lord just came to me and said, whoa, the thorn is going to stay. My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, why does the Lord allow suffering in this world? And I promise you, sometimes when you're going through the suffering, then it's not nice to think about it in this way. Now, when we're all well and good, we say, you know, yeah, the Lord uses suffering for His glory. That's, buck up, brother, pull up your socks, brother. The Lord uses your suffering for His glory. It's not so nice when we're going through it, right? <laughs> And the, when the shoe is on the other foot, it's a bit more painful. But the reality of it is that the Lord uses suffering for different purposes within humankind. And in this case, he's saying, I want you to know. I want you to know that although you have all of this preeminence above your brothers and sisters, talking to Paul now, and when we look at it in our lives now, you have... You've worked hard in your job. You achieve a certain goal within your job. You're now a CEO. And because you have this preeminence now, you've achieved this preeminence. The Lord doesn't want you to boast in your own glory. And for this sake, he gave Paul a thorn in the flesh. A thorn that really, it, it hurt him. It says the messenger of Satan, that's what he calls us, to buffet me. And then after that, when the Lord says, my strength is made perfect in weakness, when you are weak, I want to come in and I want to minister to you. I want to work with you. I want to work through you. 
Then Paul says, well, then, then forget everything else. Then my pleasure is in my infirmities because the Lord works through me and with me in my infirmities. My pleasure is in my reproaches because that's when the Lord is working in and through me. The, my pleasure is in persecutions and in distresses because that's when the Lord works in and through me. That is when he comes to the fore and I'm put in the background. And if, if we could only know how wonderful that is when he is in the front and we are just behind him. Holding on to, his, to the hem of his garment with our whole might so that we can follow wherever he's leading. If we only understand how beautiful that is, what a privilege that is. Maybe it'll make us understand the concept of suffering a little more. But let's look at the thorns in our life. And, and, and let's look at the power that it has over us. Right? I'm going to talk through this a little quickly, but please, uh, you know, message me or something if you, if you want to talk through this a little bit more in detail. But in Genesis chapter 3, the Lord curses, uh, you know, the man has fallen. The Lord... Uh, gives the curse to the serpent and to the woman and to the man, right? And he says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Uh, I wish Celeste was on the call, and I can tell her the the herb was a curse. I want to have I want to have more uh, tasty meat and and those kind of things. Now I just I just play sorry. In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread, uh, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So what will come forth out of the ground as a curse to mankind? The thorn will come forth. What did, what was niggling Paul? What was that persecution of Paul? I don't want to say niggling. What was the persecution of Paul? It was the thorn in the flesh. Right? What is that thorn that the Bible is talking about? In Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, we see what that thorn is. And he also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. What are the thorns and the thistles? It is the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. When we look at secular morality, or when we look at the pursuit of happiness to the point where we put it above everything else, that is a deceitfulness of riches. We want what we want and we will get what we want by any means. That is a deceitfulness. And the care of this world is I need to do certain things <coughs> to get certain things. And that creates an anxiety. It creates pressure. Imagine if we worked without, uh, I, I don't think you can ever work your best without any pressure. But imagine if we didn't have unnecessary pressure in our jobs. How wonderful our jobs would actually be to us. But it is the care of this world that is a burden to us. But as children of God, as those that have accepted the blood of Christ to wash away our sins, there is a redemption. And in Matthew chapter 27, verse 29, it says, And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, talking about the Roman uh, centurions, when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him, mocking him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And what happened to that thorns? They pierced his brow and they were covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. That curse is broken to those that would accept and those that would believe. So the thorns that are in our flesh, that suffering of humankind, it can be used for the glory of God if it is covered by the blood of Jesus. And if we do not accept the blood of Jesus, well then that curse is on us. I hope that makes sense, but 
I'm glad to talk more at length about it to anyone that, that, that would. Or if you want a separate study on that, please just ask and we'll, we'll do that. Okay, I'm going to fly through the rest of it. So what are the other purposes of suffering? Right? In 1 Thessalonians 5.14, it says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that I unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. It's talking about people in the assembly, right? And then it says, warn them that are unruly. Oh, we don't like unruly people in our assembly. We will sort them right out. Comfort the feeble-minded. No, we don't accept simpletons here. We speak only to the doctors and the lawyers in our assembly. So if you don't like it, go find another assembly. Support the weak. We don't like weak people either. It makes the rest of us look bad. Be patient toward all men. But God in his, sovereign, in his uh, sovereignty, he could, he could change these people if he wanted to, right? That's a fact. I mean, if we say God is all-powerful and God is good, he could have made them not to be unruly. He could have made those not to be weak. He could have made those not to be feeble-minded. But yet he allows it and he continues to allow it within the church, right? And he tells us, now first of all, in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, he talks to the ministers. It's talking about the ministers, but he's talking to the people on how to treat the ministers. And then it says to the people, I'm exhorting you to everyone in the assembly, not just the leaders, not just the ministers. Warn them that are unruly, so go and speak to them. Go and challenge them. Show them scripture. Comfort the feeble-minded. If they don't understand the scripture, go and comfort them. Go and tell them, hey, I also didn't understand this thing. Let's work through this together. Support the weak. Those that don't have the strength. First of all, you know, in, in, emotional, in, in an emotional state, they are weak. And support them in an emotional way. If they are weak in prayer, go and pray with them. Help them. If they are weak in anything, if they are weak in their business, if they're, you know, just say someone is, is suffering with laziness, go and help them. Go and talk to them. We support them. We don't, we don't go and beat them down. We support them, right? But why did God allow these people to be there? Not for their sakes, that they can get better. It is for our sakes. Because every one of us spends some time as one of those. And so, when we learn to minister to those people, we can be ministered to. If we are willing to minister to people, we can be ministered to. And that is the community in suffering that is created. Yes, it is trying, but I'm standing with you. And you create a bond that the Lord has created, that the Lord wanted there to be. In the body of Christ, we need to be joined. The arm is joined to the shoulder. And the shoulder is joined to the, to the, you know, to the neck. And, and through these adversities and through the, uh, through the uh, infirmities, that is how we are bonded together because we are there supporting one another. We are carrying one another. We are looking after one another. Now I'm often very hard when I talk to, to the younger people and, and in the coaching and in the sessions, sometimes I'm a bit too hard. Um, but it is because of, it is out of love. And I say, you know, you, you guys always know that I'm there for you. And, and all the ministers are there for you. And all of the people are there for you. If you want to reach out to anyone, you have, the, you have access to do so. Reach out to them and say, oh, you know, uh, Feel, feel led of the Lord to speak to uh, the person that you're going to speak to. Don't, don't just speak to someone because uh, you don't want to speak to someone else or, or, you know, I don't know how to say this without being too blunt. Don't, don't speak to someone because, um, you know, out of a physical nature. No, we, 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 you know, if you're attracted to someone, don't speak to them and, and, and say, I want to talk to you about my prayer life and stuff like that. Don't, you know, this is not meant to be used like that. But I'm saying, um, use people 
uh, or, or speak to people as coaches and as and as mentors and all of these things because you see something in them that you need and that you want and that can help you in your spiritual growth the other stuff is for other times i right? don't use the word of god for for your own intention that is secular morality again right that that is that is not what we're preaching acts chapter 20 verse 35 it says i have showed you all things how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the lord jesus how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive what is he saying he's saying the blessing is to those that support the weak the blessing is to those that warn them that are unruly the blessing is to those that comfort the feeble-minded so why why do people go through suffering and why are they there well they're there for your sake and when you are going through that suffering you are there for their sake right quickly the the five purposes of suffering and uh, it's just broken down into five there are more but these are the five uh that i've gone through and the first is repentance we go through suffering because the lord shows us that we need to repent of our sins and ourselves in luke 13 verses 4 and 5 it says uh, or those 18 upon whom the tower in Solomon fell and slew them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem. So there was a tragedy that happened there. There was a tower in, in Salome and it fell on 18 people and they, were, and they were killed. Right? Then the Lord is asking, do you think they were worse sinners than the other people that live here? I tell you nay, but except ye repent. We shall all likewise perish so when we see suffering in the world it should give us the zeal to repent of our sins we all know the very famous scripture if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways then will i hear from heaven and heal their land right i said a famous passage of scripture and i misquoted it Forgive me for that. <laughs> right. uh, bad, bad form. Okay, next one, reliance. Um, in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9, it says, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength insomuch that we despaired even of life. They were persecuted so badly that they they wished they weren't even alive but we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves but in god which raised the dead when we see suffering when we see death we know that the lord raised from the dead and he has the power to raise anyone from the dead that would associate themselves that would identify themselves with him as you are buried together with him in baptism so shall you be raised up to newness of life all right so when we see suffering it should instill in us a feeling of reliance on him all right uh righteousness hebrews 12 verses 6 uh and then 10 and 11 for whom the lord loveth he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth for uh, for they verily for a few days chased us after our own pleasure after their own pleasure but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous nevertheless afterward it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. What is it saying? It says, when I'm going through the suffering, it's not nice. It's grievous. But afterwards, it yields peaceable fruit. Right? And that's what the Lord wants. He wants us, He is calling us to righteousness. When we go through suffering, it should call us back to righteousness. And we know these things work together for our good. Another purpose for suffering is reward. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, 
worketh for us a far more exceeding and external weight of glory. I've gone over time. I wanted to spend time on this one because I have a testimony that, that happened yesterday. I will send the testimony on the group chat and then uh, maybe, maybe uh, say it on Sunday as well. But an amazing testimony that, you know, we go through these light afflictions which seem like the world to us at that moment. But it work it worketh for us a far more exceeding and external weight of glory. There is something on the other side. It, you know, when we go through suffering on this side, we say, yes. When I get to that side, there's not going to be any of this. And when we see someone pass on, it should give us a joy in our hearts. Obviously, we feel sad. But it should give us a joy in our hearts if someone has passed on in Christ because we know that they are going to a better place and they're going to be there waiting for us because that's where we want to be. And the fifth one is as a reminder. When we go through suffering, we are reminded of Christ. Philippians 3.10 That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto his death. When I go through these things, I remember that he went through them for my sake. He has taken the curse on himself. So we are not cursed by these things anymore. These things now are just there to show us that this life is not the end goal. It's reminding us that we are associated with him and we identify with him. Through suffering, we see a different side to God that we have not experienced. And we, you know, you, you, speak, to, you speak to godly people that, that have gone through real heartache, real pain and suffering. And I was listening to a testimony of a parent that had a, a child that, that, was, uh, that was struggling with, a, with an illness, a bad illness. And he said, and they would pray for other children and those children would get healed and his son was not getting healed. And he said, but I, I know that the Lord is using this for his glory. And I think that a parent that can say that, man, that is, that is an insight into God that we sometimes don't understand even. But we see a side to God that we cannot experience outside of that because God says that he is a comforter and if we do not have something to be comforted from, then how can we experience him as a comforter? The Lord says he is a healer. If we do not have sickness and, and, and pain, how can we know what healing is? To experience him as a healer, to experience him as a redeemer. How could we if we weren't lost? To experience Him as a strong tower. How could we if we weren't afraid? To experience Him as a restorer. And how could we if we were not unfairly taken from? To experience Him as the light. And how could we if we have not experienced darkness? Most of all to experience Him as a Savior. And everyone can because we all were lost. I've got more slides, but I'm going to end here this evening. This is a purpose for suffering. We don't want suffering. And the last thing I want is to see my brother or my sister in pain and in distress. But that is why we are there to act as, you know, their, their, uh, their brothers and their sisters. There's no better way to explain it. We are there to comfort. And we are there to warn. And we are there to support. And when we do that together, the Lord comes on the scene. And He manifests Himself. Allow the Lord to work through you. Allow the Lord to minister through you. By doing what he says in his word. Be his hands and feet. If you don't, he'll do it anyway. You just will do it with someone else. And you've lost that opportunity. Be there. And do these things. I'm sorry I've gone on a little long. But I pray that it was uh, 
somewhat of an answer to a very difficult question. And I pray that it was a blessing to you this evening.